Hello and welcome to another edition of Nature Live, the online show that takes you behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London. Have you ever been pond dipping or walked past a small pond and wondered what was lurking in the water underneath? Well, today we're going to be exploring life in ponds and in particular, the pond that can be found in the grounds of the Natural History Museum in London. The museum is fortunate to not only have a beautiful building and wonderful galleries, but grounds around it, part of which have been carefully cultivated over the years to create a beautiful urban wildlife garden, a living gallery, if you like. In the centre of this garden is a pond that is often teeming with life, some of which we're going to be exploring today. As always, if you've got any comments or questions for us, please pop them in the chat and I can put them to our guests today. Uh, perhaps you visited the museum's gardens. If you have, tell us about that. What do you remember? Did you have a chance to look in the pond? What did you find? I've got two guests today who've spent many hours exploring the pond in the garden. Sylvia Myers, who's an ecologist and volunteer manager for the museum, and Anthony Pincus, a science educator who works with schools and visitors to the museum and galleries, and of course, the garden. Thank you both very much for joining me today. How are we? Good. Uh, yeah, very good today. Um, enjoying the sunshine out in the wildlife garden. Um, so because I'm live in the wildlife garden, you might get the odd wildlife garden sound, hopefully lots of nice bird song, but um, unfortunately also it is next to a busy road. So you might get the odd, uh, the odd siren or noisy motorbike going past. <laughs> No, it's a it's a wonderful contrast of nature in in the city, uh, and we'll talk we'll talk a little bit about that later, Sylvia. But yeah, it's looking like a lovely day uh, for you. And uh, Anthony, are you are you in the museum as well? Yes, I'm at, I'm in the museum. I'm actually in the Investigate Gallery, which is one of our hands-on galleries. Um, so I I perched in here at the moment. Excellent. Okay, and I'm coming to you from uh, from home as well. So we're all all over the place today, but coming together today to to, to chat about the, the the garden at the museum, which a lot of people might overlook if they they come and visit because uh, you get so distracted by all the all the galleries. Um, it's easy to forget there's this beautiful garden and, and pond uh, at the centre of it. Um, but my first question for you guys today, you know, we're talking about pond life. Um, when does a puddle become a pond? Is there a clear is there a clear definition? Um, yeah, there isn't really a clear definition. So um, even a little body of water, like a puddle, if it's left for a few days, you will start to get some life starting to find its way there. And then you kind of think, oh, when am I going to start calling it a pond? Um, so a lot of ponds in, in the wild, naturally, are very changeable habitats. And they'll actually only be wet for maybe half the year, a few months of the year. Um, we might call them ephemeral, what a fancy word. Um, and, and so that definition between puddle and pond is, is, is quite a loose one. And it happens up at the other end as well. So when we start thinking, oh, is it a pond or is it a lake? Again, it's, it's not a very strict definition. Some people say it's to do with the depth or the size or whether plant, plant, uh, plants can go in the middle, um, but it's not really strict definition. So a pond is, it's a body of still, of still water. Um, I sort of agree on that. Okay, and it's, cause I always thought there was, a pond was kind of um, self-isolated if you like. Um, it wasn't necessarily being fed by a stream or feeding into a river or anything like that. Is that, is that part of the definition or it, it's not really? Yeah, I mean, so in terms of the life that's in the pond, as long as it's, as long as it's still, it might, be fed completely by rain in which case yeah it's going to be isolated um or it might be fed by by a spring um or or just about by a stream but if it's a still if it, if it itself is still then it's still going to act exactly like a pond ecologically right right and where do we typically find them because you know i think we often associate them with kind of the countryside and or or uh, things like that but you know people have ponds in their gardens sometimes and you know we've mentioned the museum um, where you are, uh, where you're both today, and it's got a pond to in the middle of, you know, one of the busiest cities in the world. Um, yeah, so if we go back, back in history, then ponds would naturally have formed as rivers kind of meandered across their course and kept changing course, then you end up with little pools left behind, um, or certain geologies tend to form um, ponds, so where there's clay areas or where on like peat bog landscapes tend to have ponds on. Um, but those kind of ponds are becoming a bit rarer now. And then they're kind of 
because we tend to put our rivers in channels. Um, and then there's also agricultural ponds. Um, so you might get like dew ponds in chalk areas where naturally the rain would just flow away. So instead you put some clay down um, and that creates a pool that livestock can drink from or mill ponds um, or duck ponds. But nowadays we don't really need those anymore because we've got troughs. So you find a few ponds like that. Um, but yeah, more often than not, the ponds that we come across are in parks and in gardens that have been um, been made by humans. Yeah, and I think I imagine they're a really popular thing. You know, um, folk would love to have a pond. I'd love to have a pond in my garden. Unfortunately, it's not really big enough to get the sort of pond that I would like. But we'll talk a little bit later, actually, that you don't really need a lot of space if you if you want to have a pond in there. It's uh, you can you can. Uh, squeeze one in, in in surprising places so th clearly they must be quite important for nature you know th these ponds i imagine are creating habitats uh for animals um anthony can you tell us a little bit about that is there uh, they they play a key role in 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 an ecosystem absolutely yeah they're really important um just in terms of um the range of habitats that they um have for um organisms to live in so you've you've got all the organisms that are able to live in the water um, surface dwellers, um, organisms living in the margins, um, and of course, great habitat for plants as well. So yeah, absolutely fantastic um, in terms of uh, community structure. Um, yeah. So there, I guess if you if you create a pond, you are creating a space for other animals to come to, whether they're living in the pond or or around it. Absolutely. Or if they're using it, um, as in um, coming to it. Um, feeding um or living there absolutely and what does the wildlife found in a pond tell us about it you know is it is it a case that if your pond is full of loads and loads of animals then it must be a really really healthy great pond well it depends what you're finding um in your pond um what we can do is we can um allocate a score to different organisms that you might find in your pond so some organisms score more highly than others so if you're finding things like dragonfly dragonfly larvae or caddisfly larvae um, that's a, a really good indication that you've got lots of oxygen in the water um, and it suggests you've got a quite healthy pond um, as on the other end of the scale if you're finding just um, rat-tailed maggots um, or water hog lice it suggests that it may be the water may not be may not have as much oxygen in, um, but it, having those, um, taking samples, um, seeing what's in your pond uh, can give you a much better idea of what, how healthy that pond is. Fantastic, excellent. Um, well, we're gonna take a look at um, the pond that we've got here in the, in the museum, I think. So um, folks, if you've got any questions that do come to mind um, uh, while I'm chatting with Sylvia and Anthony, do pop them in the chat and um, I'll try and get through them. Uh, uh, during the show today. And if you've been to a pond or you've got a pond, tell us about it. Maybe uh, you've uh, done some pond up in yourself. What kind of things have you found in your pond? Let us know. Um, but let's uh, let's go and have a look at um, the Wildlife Gardens pond in the, in the museum. So I know that uh, Sylvia and Anthony, you both went pond dipping um, uh, earlier today. So uh, I wonder if we can uh, pop a camera in there and, and have a look at some of the things that we've uh, we've seen. So can we get the, the pond camera up? Um, <laughs> apparently the pond camera has overheated uh -oh. um, so we're going to have to come back to that in a minute um, it's such a it's a hot day in in, uh, in London so let's hopefully we'll come back to that um, but while, while we're waiting on that um, Anthony if I could ask you a little bit about it's not just creepy crawlies that you find in a pond is it you you, you get you know bigger animals too whether that be things like frogs or, or fish or ducks and things as well is, is that true what kind of um, impact do those uh, those animals have on uh, on a pond so we're quite lucky here at the natural history museum in that our ponds don't have any fish in um, and because of that we have a, a, a wide range of insect life um, invertebrate life in our ponds if we had if we had fish in those ponds um, they would gobble up all those invertebrates and we, we wouldn't have the range of invertebrates that we do have so i think that's that's a really good thing for, for our ponds in particular um but as you said our ponds are really important not just for the invertebrates using them but the vertebrates as well so i know that we have um frogs and toes they've been spotted um we've got um 
more hens um, and ducks as well in the pond, uh, making use of it. Um, so those invertebrates undoubtedly will be forming uh, part of those animals' diets um, and, and, yeah, linking that with food chains and food webs um, for our, our, our wildlife garden. So when you talk about food chains, are you talking about, you know, what's eating what in, in that pond environment, I guess? Yeah. So what's, what's giving energy to the next level up in our food chain? So I've got one. Yeah, I'll just bring this over. So this is just a representation of some of the things that in our wildlife garden that you might bring that closer to you there, um, might be happening. Um, so these are, please come on, we've got dragon, dragonfly larvae and great diving beetles right at the top of our food chains, being the, the, the top predators, moving down um, to uh, prey items. So we've got uh, water fleas, um, leeches, and then right at the bottom, um, obviously we've got algae, which is giving energy to all those organisms ultimately. Um, but we've got freshwater shrimps, so the water hog lice um, and snails um, in particular. So very important in terms of the whole community in that pond. So there's a lot, a lot going on there that you might not see when you initially glance at the pond. Absolutely, um, yes. Well, I think we can. I think we can now go to our pond camera, so we can actually see uh, some of these uh, now. So let's uh, let's bring that up and have a look uh, at what's in our pond. So Fantastic. look at that. So. Sylvia, you're uh, you're there at the pond side. Um, tell us what uh, what you found in the pond today. Um, so just I'll just reassure everyone straight first of all that even even though the camera overheated, then I've been very lovingly keeping all of the uh, pond creatures in the shade, but um, not caring enough about my own camera. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> this one is a freshwater hog louse. So um, some of the creatures that we get in the pond will spend their whole lives. Um, in the water and this is this is one of those so um, this is actually a little crustacean so it's related to crabs and lobsters and wood life on the land um, you can see it just cleaning its antennae there got to keep them in check um, and this yeah this is an entirely aquatic um, organism it breathes it breathes the water through its skin um, and um, and it will shed its skin when it when it outgrows it, just like a woodlouse. I was going to say it looks very very similar to the woodlice that I see like under rocks and stuff in my garden. So it's it's um, a very similar species then. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, um, I just had a, a question come in asking what, what does it eat? Oh, what the hell is it? So they are very similar to woodlice they are detritivores so they eat rotting dead things um so dead leaves possibly dead um dead animals but mostly mostly dead anything that's dead and organic that, at the bottom of the pond um that's what that's what woodlice will that's what oh, hog lice will eat fantastic excellent um so imagine you could, you could end up with quite a lot of those in a pond um, and they sound like they're quite useful uh, if they're breaking up some of that uh, that decaying matter um what yeah. um what other things have we got in there um so uh, here we have a oh look at that fantastic mayfly nymph so it's got these beautiful little fan tails I'm gonna hide under some duckweed. Let's see if we can get that. <laughs> it's getting camera shy. It's yeah. live um, on the internet. <laughs> so this little mayfly, this is um one of the creatures which starts off in the pond but then will um will leave the pond as an adult. So um so this mayfly will sort of it'll spend maybe a year or so um as a larvae and then probably only a few days um as as an adult flying insect flying and dancing around above the pond um just mating and then um and then that's 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 it for the adult adult stage of its life that's amazing so it it, it spends almost all its life looking like that in in the water yeah. and only we're talking a day a couple of days as an actual fly yeah yeah <laughs> it's, we shouldn't yeah, be calling them mayflies the then because they're, they're they're hardly there 
<laughs> oh, it's, it's quite fast when it wants to be. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> really, um, it's quite a it's quite a dramatic looking thing. What, what are those um, little appendages uh, sort of on the, the tail for it? Is it? It looks like they've got a kind of a three pronged tail at the back. What's going on there? Um, I'm not quite sure what the three prongs are for, to be honest. Um, so as an adult, it's it has those as well. And they're kind of, um, and they're really quite, they're even longer when they're an adult. And they're like these amazing things. And they, because mayflies do this kind of dance where they fly up and down the pond. Um, and so, so maybe they're used in, in display possibly, but I'm kind of just guessing with that. Um, yeah, no, it's a fascinating looking uh, looking thing. Now, is, I was mentioning to Anthony um, uh, while you were um, getting the camera ready that obviously there are some bigger things that you find in ponds that might be eating up some of these guys. Um, and you don't want too many of them, obviously, because we want to be able to see these uh, these mini beasts here. But um, have we got anything? Did you manage to find anything in the pond that was uh, yeah. a little bit larger? Well, I've got the magnifier one. I'll show you the little baby version. So oh, wow. this is a baby newt. It's called an eft. Um, and the little fluffy bits behind its head are external gills. So um, this little young newt will have started off as a little egg, lovingly wrapped in a leaf by its mother, and then um, hatched out in the pond. And it will be eating all the little invertebrates around the pond. Um, and it will spend spend the winter there um and they sort of they take three or four years to to become a fully grown adult but they'll probably lose those lose those gills within the first within the first year those gills um, look fantastic they're really they're quite flamboyant in a way the way that they're spread out in the water on its head there they're, 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 yeah they are just beautiful <laughs> i'll move on to the um to the adults Oh yes. So these are some lovely adult smooth newts. Have you got a good picture on them then? I think we've lost the picture, Sylvia. If um I don't know if there's a way you can adjust that. Ooh. Or we can uh maybe come back to you in a moment. Yeah, I don't think there's much yep. I can do to change okay. to get the picture. Let's, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll come back to you in a moment, uh, Sylvia, because it would be great if we can see uh, if we can see those newts uh, uh, in their habitat there. But, um, Anthony, if I could uh, just come back to you while, while Sylvia's um, fixing that. Um, the, some of the, you know, the, the, the ponds, there's clearly a lot in the pond. Um, is the public able to, uh, to, to pond dip at, at the museum's pond before? Is that something that they're able to do and actually look at these for themselves when they visit? So... Um, if when the public comes to visit, uh, they can't actually pond it themselves, but uh, we do. We get, we do that for them. So the science educators will will take pond dips um, and put them into trays um, and lay them out on tables uh, for the public to to see what's in our pond. Um, and, and yeah, it's much like Sylvia's doing right now. So we just have them in the trays, uh, magnifying glasses, and with various keys to identify things. Yeah. Um, it must be such a great, you know, because if you haven't got a pond at home, and even if you do, I guess, you're not necessarily going to have the same things in it. Um, and it's it's just seeing that that variety of stuff that you can find is is, is so interesting. We do have school groups in um, who do do pond dipping. So um, when the school groups come in, um, they are able to, um, we've got a platform and we can dip from that platform. They dip, they collect their sample, they place it into their trays um, take it back to their tables and in groups look at what's in their trays and again identify look for adaptations um, so yes so Great. school groups can um, public we put it out for them to have a look at yeah well actually seeing those trays of things is what's really exciting isn't it well i think we can go back to to sylvia now so let's uh let's bring the pond cam back up and see so it looks like we've got a couple of newts um relaxing there in the sunshine yep so um yeah, these are our lovely smooth newts. And um, we've got a male and a female here. The female is at the bottom of the picture. Um, 
And oh, we've, um, we've lost it again. Sorry, oh, Sylvia. No. <laughs> Um, what a shame. We did get to see a little bit, though. Um, do you want me to talk, well talk a bit about the apes, then, away, um, even if we can't see them? Yes, tell us. Um, so, um, so, yes, these are smooth mutes. Um, they're amphibians, so they will actually spend quite a lot of time um, out of the pond hunting um, little slugs and snails and um and wood lice rather than hog lice um on the land and they hibernate outside of the pond um and they can they can live for quite a long time they can live for sort of 10 or 15 years and every single newt has a different pattern of spots um on its belly so it's a bit like a fingerprint okay that's i didn't 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 know that um so we've uh, while we've got uh, got you there uh, so we've had a, a question come in uh, on Facebook asking about frogs. Um, uh, do frogs eat slugs? Um, I've got a vested interest in this because there's a lot of slugs in my garden as well. Um, they, they will. It's not like, it's not their favourite, but um, but yes, so frogs and toes and newts um, will will all eat, um, will all eat slugs. When they get really excited is when it's flying ant day and when they can eat all of the, uh, all the flying <laughs> ants, they come out of their nest. And that, that's around this uh, this time of year, I think. Um, it, yeah, I've, def I've definitely seen some flying ants, certainly in the UK anyway. I've definitely seen some flying yeah. ants around. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get the camera back, uh, Sylvia. It's still a bit uh, a bit blurry. So I think we'll uh, we'll maybe have to uh, to close that for now. Um, and I'll, I'll pop back uh, uh, to Anthony at the moment. So, um, Anthony, we're, we're talking about... Um, ponds you know we've got a beautiful pond uh obviously the wildlife garden in the museum but is is a pond something that you can have even if you've not got a, a big garden to hand i i think so um sylvia what are you sort of your what are your feelings on, on pond building pond building um so um it can be really really simple and straightforward um so if you um don't have any space in your garden or just a little tiny garden or even a balcony you can make a pond just in a container um, so that can be a large um, a large bucket or a barrel um, and if, if you put in into that bucket or barrel some stones to give creatures ways in and ways out and some plants to help oxygenate the water um, then you you will get a lot of life in even just a very small container um, and then if you want to scale that up a bit, um, if your garden is a bit bigger, but just all concrete, um, you can make a pond in a raised bed, exactly the same way you should make any raised bed where you put sleepers around the side, put a pond lighter in. Um, and again, you need those plants and stones to get in and out. Um, but if you do have the space, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, if you can make, um, if you can actually just dig a hole and make a, um, and make a full size, wildlife pond um and it doesn't it doesn't have to be deep in fact it's better if it's not deep which makes it a lot easier to dig um so most of the pond life that we that we see is um lives in that much shallower um bit of the water and that's where pond plants like to grow as well mm -hmm. um so if you make a nice shallow sided pond um the pond creatures will absolutely love that they, they will they will find it uh, and they, they will come and you know it's it's funny I, so I, as i said i i don't have a pond but um um i did find a frog in my back garden um one summer and i and my back garden is completely um surrounded by fencing so i was like how on earth did this frog get into the get in there and it, um I, you know there's no water for it right so i, I got it in a box and, and took it to the local park and released it into the pond there. Uh, hope, I hope it had a good life in that pond. I never <laughs> saw it again. Um, but it turned out it had come from a neighbor's pond about two or three doors down the road. And it had somehow got, I don't know how it had done it. It had gone under or over all the fencing to, to get into my garden. So it's, um, you know, these animals will, will track down your pond if there's one to be found. It, it definitely uh, sounds like it. They will frogs and frogs you know they because they're foraging outside of the pond they only frogs only really come to the pond to breed or if they get really hot so they can travel for i think up, up to about a mile that they're, they're surprisingly good at moving themselves and, and the newts that i've got here i keep having to um they're in a very steep-sided jug 
Um, but I keep having to sort of poke them down so they <laughs> climb out of the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've been very good uh, letting us uh, look at day. them briefly this morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got um, uh, we've had a question coming from Angela on Facebook. Um, they're asking how how can I protect frogs in my garden? Uh, I did have a lot, but my cats my cats kept killing them. Um, so what I'd probably say about that is, is if there's, um, there's, so there's going to, there's a particular time when, um, uh, it's the frog breeding season in the, um, in the springtime, it will usually end of February, beginning of March. And if, for uh, if for just that period, you can keep your cats inside a little bit more, particularly overnight, because they're actually quite, frogs are actually quite nocturnal, um, then the, that will really benefit the frog. So at least they get the chance to to breed and have their spawn um, and that that should help help with that okay great some good advice there uh, another question um, on the topic of frogs um, uh, Daisy's asking what is the difference between a frog and a toad that's a good question um, so in the this is this applies for the UK ones the ones you'll most commonly come across um, so you'll the, the, there's usually there's a common common frog, Rana temporiana, and common toad, buffo buffo. This is what I'm talking about here. So the frog is much more pointy at the front. Um, actually, if you got that slide that's got um, that's that's kind of got two frogs on top of each other, well, it looks like two frogs. Yeah, I'm um, sure we can. I'm sure we can get that. In, that one up. Uh, in a so, there we go. This is actually a frog which has got a bit confused and it's grabbed onto a toad. So it's great for telling the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so on top you've got the frog which has got much shinier skin and it will always have shiny skin even if it's not been in um, the water for a while. Um, and it's, it's usually a bit pointier at the front. Um, and then the toad is warty. Um, it's got a much kind of flatter, rounder face. Um, if you find a toad outside of the pond, it will usually have dry skin. Um, and, um, and out of preference, um, frogs will usually jump and toads will usually walk. Um, so if it's escaping from you very slowly, it's, it's, it's more probably a, probably a toad. <laughs> right, then in which case it was definitely a frog I had in my garden then, because it was really trying to jump away yeah, yeah. Uh, brilliant um uh, another question uh coming from uh, youtube um uh, i want to know if newts eat algae and live in it um o only when they're really young they might eat a bit of algae but unfortunately newt newts are um yeah newts, newts are predators so um even even when they're when they've got to the size which i showed you they'll be mostly eating um small invertebrates um in the pond um and they're yeah they're not they're not huge fans of um of, of an excess of algae in a pond they can they can cope with a bit but um mm. yeah it doesn't really benefit them yeah it's, it's, that's, i think is that is it true to say that's often the case that if you've got a lot of algae that's a bit of a deterrent for other for other organisms in the pond yeah it's um algae tends to um sort of blanket the surface and um and then it will um block out the light to the plants which are providing oxygen in the water so it it can it can cause problems in a pond if there's if there's too much of it a little bit won't you know do any harm but if, mm. if your entire pond is covered with with blanket weed and algae then it's it's yeah you do need to sort of remove some of that to let the light through yeah excellent okay well thanks very much guys for your questions hopefully we've uh uh, we've been able to answer those for you but i've got one uh, last question i want to ask you both before before we wrap up today and that's um about some of the exciting plans that we've actually got for the wildlife garden uh, at the museum because um it's been in its current form now for for many many years but we want to make it even bigger don't we we do yes yeah. so um we've got a fantastic plan coming up which is all part of this urban nature project um and that's going to transform the the whole grounds across the museum. Um, a lot of the wildlife garden become, stays fairly unchanged because the habitats are good. Why are we going to change them? Um, but the ponds do need relining. Unfortunately, with an artificial liner, it does have a lifespan. Um, so we're taking the opportunity to make the ponds even bigger 
Um, so they'll cover more of an area. Um, we'll also change the profile a bit. So we'll have more shallow areas, which are um, better for a lot of the pond uh, creatures that we're seeing. Um, and it will also in improve the access for, um, for pond dipping. Um, so hopefully everybody can, can pond dip. Um, and we're going to do the whole process really carefully to try and reduce um, any any loss um, of, of animals and plants as we do this. So we're kind of hoping to decant the pond into some big tanks, and then wow. and then and then bring them back again. And we'll across the whole because no one's really done this before. So um, we'll be carefully monitoring. We've already done a lot of newt surveys, um, and we'll be doing um, invertebrate surveys as well to carefully monitor to see. What, what the effect is um, on the pond. Oh, that's a, it's amazing. It, incredible to think we're going to try and sort of move all these animals out of a pond, give them a brand new, even better home, and then get them back in there uh, yep. as quickly as can, really uh, ambitious. And we can see on the screen at the moment, we've got some sort of uh, artist's drawings of what, what the new space is, is going to look like. And it, you know, it's, you've got to remind yourself that this is a garden that's in the middle of a city because there's a lot of green, it's such a lush environment, isn't it? yeah um yeah it's fantastic you know they kind of sit sitting here now and i can i can hear from my word in the background but um but also um we had a lovely wren serenading us just as we were doing the warm-up um and then you know all that you can see on the camera is is greenery <laughs> yeah it is it's that a really interesting lovely juxtaposition of the the urban environment and and the natural world are coming coming together um so yeah really exciting to see to see those plans and Hopefully, um, in uh, the not too distant future, we'll have a an even bigger pond for people to come and look at, and um, there'll be even more things in it. But um, thank you so much, both of you, for for chatting today, and uh, thank you, Sylvia, for um, uh, showing us in the in the pond uh, with your camera there. It was nice to get a glimpse of the newts and some of the other things in there. Um, I'll uh, I'll let you return them. I imagine they're quite keen to get back in the pond uh, yeah. on this sunny day. Um, but. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Sylvia, for, for joining us today. It's been wonderful to, to speak to you and uh, and all the best with uh, uh, your future work in, in the garden. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys as well for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the show and, and found it interesting. And if you do find yourself uh, in the London area, pop along to the, to the museum and have a, have a wander around uh, the garden and uh, see if you can spot any life in and around our pond. But it's been lovely uh, chatting to you all today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Next week, we're going to be exploring the most diverse animals on the planet, the beetles. But until then, thank you very much for joining us. All the best and see you soon.